people here today. I think that even, you know, to some degree, my life is affected by this. We think that what we do is good enough. We think that our church attendance, our Bible study, our prayer, things that we know, uh, you know, the verses that we know, the doctrines that we know, that that's good enough. It ain't good enough. It is good enough. Father demands us to conform to the kingdom, to be a part of the kingdom. What's going on in the realms of the kingdom? I don't care about how much you think you know about the kingdom from a biblical point of view. The issue is uh, if you do know, in fact, let me say this, if you do know things really about the kingdom and then you fail to get desperate about it, can you fix my mic? You fail to get desperate about it, boy, you're more responsible than about people who didn't know nothing, okay? Because if we know things about the kingdom and then we're allowed to accommodate in our life that which is not the kingdom, we're, we're, being, we're willing to literally say, it's okay that I don't have signs, wonders, miracles going on in my life. It's okay that I don't have the power and the authority of Jesus Christ in my life. It's okay that I don't reach the lost. It's okay that I'm not impacting the world. I mean, those are the things of the kingdom, you see. The kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace, and the Holy Ghost, okay? Those are the things of the kingdom. The kingdom is the power and the authority that really, where we're filled with such love and compassion and mercy for the lost. Look, unless you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, you're just going to be filled with you. So too many people think that it's okay, that they're good enough, that what they're doing is fine. It's not. What I'm doing is not fine. What I'm doing, I, God has commanded me to be conformed to the image of the Son. And if I, you know what? It's one thing to have a desperation when you see, wait a minute, I, there's still, I've got a lot of things going on in my life that I, that, that, you know, really, there's a lot of things, I should say it this way, there's a lot of things going on in the life of Jesus that aren't revealed in my life and I better be passionate about having them because God's passionate about having them, me having them. So he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Therefore, the reality of it is, is you and I, we're going to have our eyes open. We're going to have an understanding heart. And if you don't understand how fundamentally to begin to take everything to the Lord in prayer, I, I believe too many people begin to be, they, they begin to be um, captivated, caught up, entangled by the circumstances of their life. So now all of their meaning and their value and, and, and their sense of self-worth and their sense of, of peace is really all, could, you know, contingent upon what's going on in their self-interest because they've never learned how to just take every care and every issue to the Lord in prayer to the point to where the, the peace of God overwhelms them and the glory and the purposes of God overwhelms them because that's the contrast. This prayer, what we're doing, is absolutely essential in your life. You will never break through to what I'm talking about in understanding of the spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand what God wants for you in context of the, being conformed to the image of Jesus, in the context of seeking the kingdom of God so that the kingdom of God would be in your life and revealed through your life until you break through in prayer. Until it, and let me tell you something. Prayer isn't something you're punching the time clock for. It's something that you've allowed God the Holy Ghost to fill you with a desperation for. A desperation. In other words, there are various phases of breakthrough in prayer. It starts off with the people just, they're just kind of bored. What time is it now? You know, because it's not really going anywhere. Give yourself to prayer because that's the first thing. You've got to break through that veil. That's a veil you've got to break through. Where you're, you're detached. You're, you're more concerned about what's going on in the job, what's going on here and up there. And, and that's, it's a pro, that's a process. And unless you give yourself to praying to break through prayer, you're always going to be stuck there. You will always be there for the rest of your life. Some people think, well, I spend this lot of time doing this. It has nothing to do with how much time you've done. Okay? It has nothing to do. Well, I've been around the church for 50 years. I mean, it means nothing. How obedient have you been? How cooperative have you been? How connected have you been? Have you had that event? Okay? That event takes place in prayer. Okay? It really does. It takes place in prayer. And so, you know, how do you, how, here, here it is. The Lord in His mercy, you give yourself to prayer. You give yourself to breaking past the disinterested prayer. Get yourself, give yourself to breaking past the religious prayer, the obligation prayer, okay? And then let now the Holy Ghost, the interest of divine unction, the interest of, of fa what's in Father's heart, the interest of what Jesus desires us to be doing to fill us by the Holy Ghost. Then all of a sudden, we begin to have a partnership prayer. We begin to have, we're, we're now motivated by his interest. Imagine if you were able to stand in heaven, hear the Lord Jesus say to you, this is what's supposed to be happening right now, okay? And you see the glory of it. And actually it's greater than the glory that he revealed when he walked on the earth. And he's the manifest 
revelation of what the church is supposed to look like. Now, if you knew that, when you know that, you're going to get burdened, man. You're going to have yourself a prayer life. I mean, when you know that. See, there's a head knowledge and then there's a heart knowledge. Most people operate in head knowledge. It's, it's unfortunate because they've never broke past that. It, and it, it's just childhood in the spirit. It's just what it is. It's a head knowledge. This is what Jesus did. And we know that the church is supposed to be doing what Jesus did. But it never became a heart revelation. God wants that to become a reality for you. You must break through to that realm through prayer. It ain't going to happen any other way. It's not going to happen any other way. You need to settle it. If you can understand really what it is you're doing, okay, Papa, I want to hook up with your will. Lord, I want a heavenly vision. Jesus, I want to be connected with what's going on in your heart. Then you're, there's, a, there's a new dynamic at play here, okay? Open my eyes, oh God. Cause my heart to understand, oh God, all right? Now, so imagine you're standing there in heaven. Here, you hear the Lord Jesus talk to you. And then you turn and you look at what's going on at the church. Better yet, you turn and you look at your life. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to tell you right now, you just got yourself a prayer life that is so passionate. It's so, oh, oh God. It, it now is true. It's truth. God wants Holy Ghost and truth. So what we do is we come in here. We're going to be praying all this next week. We've got prayer tomorrow night. And um, we'll be praying all next week, every night next week. For at least an hour. Come for at least an hour. Come with a purpose to say, wait a minute. I, I've got to get past myself here. Because I'm trying to say, I'm trying to superimpose on my life things that the Bible does not describe concerning God's will. I've said it's good enough that I've come to church. It's good enough that I give in the offering. It's good enough, good enough, good enough. No, it's not. Because the Father doesn't describe that in His Word. And that's why the Lord spoke and said to me the other morning. And He said, ask the people. And it's not just you. I'm asking people all over. Because fortunately, God has blessed us to be able to impact a lot of people's lives through the web. And I praise God for the people who work and labor to make that happen. And it is a lot of work, believe me. Okay? From the filming to the getting it up on the YouTube. But the bottom line of it is, is this. We have got to grab a hold of the reality in our own lives of the things that God has called us to do and not be willing to live without it. Let me just say it, just say, bring it to close saying this. Do not be willing to have a shortcut. Do not be willing to live with less than what God has purposed and called us to be. Go ahead, pray, seek God, cry out to Him. Till he comes, has the liberty, because we give him the permission of our will, to do those things that he wants to do through our life. All Papa's, listen, I don't care who you are and what you say. The, uh, what's going on, the dynamic, and I just put it in my life, the dynamic of where I'm, my limitations are, are the places that I have not understood or been willing to let the Holy Ghost do what he wants to do through me. What changes that? Maturity. What fuels maturity? Prayer, relationship. I want you to grab it. I want you to grab it because, look, the Lord gave us all an anointing at salvation, a salvation anointing that we may know him, we may have a relationship, who may dwell in him and abide in him. A lot of people just don't really understand that. And they, they, they're caught up in the cares of this life, their job, their house, their things, their stuff, and it's a very self-interest life. But if we can break free from that, if we're willing to break free from those influences and say, Lord, I want to abide in you. I want this relationship. Then Father's purpose to take that relationship anointing and develop us to a maturity to what, whatever we ask Father, he'll do it because that's the partnership. It's amazing. You've got to decide what you want. You've got to decide what you want. But what I don't want you to do is slip into a little, you know, ditch of deception. To think that your Bible knowledge somehow is good enough. That your ideas, that your service to the Lord is, is all that you need to do. And then the Father's called us to seek first the kingdom. We understand what the kingdom is and His righteousness. He's called us to be conformed to the image of the Son. He's called us to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and authority. To go do something. And if we're without it, if we're out, if we're, if we're without those things and we're not passionate, there's something wrong with the heart, and we need to deal with it. It's called lukewarmness, slothfulness, 
There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things. We, can't, we cannot be willing to abide such a state. So what do I do? I start talking to Father. Lord, fill me with your passion. Father, I don't really have much of a prayer life here. I remember talking to the Lord like this. Lord, I'm a pretty miserable pr prayer if you're going to ask me about the quality of my prayer. Now, it would be a terrible thing if I did not have a prayer life and I was talking to you like this, wouldn't it? I'm talking to you like this. I didn't have a prayer life. I got a prayer life so I can talk to you like this, okay? Because I've gone through the thing. Oh, God, I'm, I just don't. I've got to have authority in my prayer. I've got to have fire in my prayer compared to the way that I read about, Bo, you know, Bosworth and, I mean, so many different people, you know, how they prayed. Whitfield, I'm just on the list. Like, oh, God, what does it take to change me? What does it take to fill me with your passion? What does it take for, to fill me with reality? I, so I just begin to ask the Lord for truth and reality in my life. Let me see things the way you see them. Let me understand them that what is in, according to what's in your heart. Let me, let me be able to see my life through what you've determined and purposed my life to be so I can see the contrast. And so there's, I'm going to close with this. That's why we started saying by the word of the Lord, what is it that you believe about God? What is it that you believe about his word? Do those really line up? What is it that you believe about what God said about you? And what is it that you believe about yourself? Do those things line up? If they don't, don't just sit there. Get passionate. Get passionate. Because one day the Lord will measure you. He's going to measure you. He's going to see. He's going to show you. Look at this is what you did when you got a promotion. This was your heart and your attitude when you got a promotion. And they gave you a raise. This is what happened when you got that inheritance money. This is what happened when you got praised by people around you. Here's what happened now when I called you to do something. This was your response when... I gave you an opportunity. I want my response towards heaven to be far greater than anything that's going on in earth. I don't want earth to bind my heart and hold me in prison. I don't want earth to hold you in prison. I want you to have a heavenly vision, be heavenly citizens, be seated to God, together with him in the heavenly realm, to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know who you are in perspective of what Christ Jesus has determined for you to be, and then you don't give any rest day and night until it's a reality. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Are you ready for some radical things here tonight? Okay, well, good, because I'm going to give you some radical stuff here tonight. Okay? And um, tonight I'm going to be dealing primarily with the seventh seal. Okay, we've dealt with the six, first six seals, and I'm going to deal with the seventh seal. I'm going to give you a bit of a summary here in a little bit. And... Um, you know, I've got, I've really, I've just got a lot to say. I'm going to be dealing with the seventh seal, which basically brings the seven trumpets, okay? And um, there's a lot of things that you're going to learn tonight that you uh, probably never heard <laughs> uh, or haven't known. And, of course, I guess that is some part of learning, okay? Sometimes there's things that you know, but you don't really, you've not really learned them. You can't. They're not really established in your life. We're going to get them established tonight by the help and the grace of God. I want to start off just saying, so I'm going to say something very radical to you that the Lord spoke to me when I was getting ready to come to the meeting tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? You don't want to miss this. This isn't a commercial. This is the actual meat of the stuff. Okay, this is what the Lord spoke to me coming. He said, Satan, whom we call Lucifer and the devil, along with his angels, were not satisfied with their assignment in God. They felt that they should have more they deserved better. Thus, they rebelled against God. Now, here's, can you hear that? Do you hear the risk that men run of doing the same thing? Did you know God's given you an assignment? You know He's given you a post? You know He's given you a calling and something that you should do and something, and a valued opportunity? Make sure that you keep that right before the Lord. Make sure you don't get into strife. Make sure you don't get into envy. Make sure you don't get into those things of jealousy. Make sure you don't get into those things that really are that whole spirit of pride that says, I'm not happy with my station in life. I'm not happy with my assignment. I feel I deserve more. Watch out. Watch out. Because I'm going to be talking about that tonight once again. I'm looking forward to being able to move with you into 
Revelation chapter 12 and 13 especially because Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 13 really does allow us to begin to talk a lot about current events, which is an amazing thing to consider. And if you could really grab a hold of this too, and I want you to understand, I'm, I'm going to talk to you tonight about urgency. I'm not, and if you're watching me by the web, I'm not going to try, I'm going to try my very best to just be absolutely accurate with the Word of God. I'm not going to try to find, you say things that you might agree with. I'm going to try my very best in God, the Holy Ghost, to be accurate with the Word of God for the sake of you becoming urgent about the day that you live in. People say, oh, wow, we're in the last day. Well, fine. All that is is a little cheap thrill for you if it didn't result in an urgency. And wait a minute, a reality striking your soul going, wait a minute, is, is all well with my soul? And you better not have a subjective as all well with my soul. You better be comparing yourself to what God said in his word, not by other people. People make a mistake of comparing themselves among people. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, and I'm better than the other one. Forget about it. What did Jesus say he's calling us to be? What has he purposed us to be? And so I'm going to speak these things tonight um, for that as one of my reasons, one of my purpose, to just call you to a place of urgency. Okay? I did, I thought, my goodness, I would like to just go ahead and jump to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13 so I could talk about current events a little bit more. But I need to talk about something that is even more important right now, I think. Because I believe that there's many people speaking, they're speaking out of either just a place of deception, they're, they're speaking out of a place of ignorance, or they're speaking out of a place of ambition, that has led them astray and they're leading other people astray. There are people that are saying right now that we're in the second, third, fourth trumpet judgment, that we're already in Revelation chapter 8 and 9, and I'm going to prove to you that we're not. And that's what I'm doing this for. Chrono Reve the book of Revelation is very chronological. I mean, we're going to talk to you about numbers of days. It, the, the book of Revelation brings it down to literally brings it down to years and months and days and hours. The whole chronology of John, the Gospel of John, is so valuable to us because without John being the chronologer in the Gospels, we would have known that Jesus' ministry was a little more than a year. He chronologically keeps time points for us in his Gospel so that we know that Jesus' ministry was a little over three years. Okay? He does, God uses them in the same way in the book of Revelation, and he says, write the things which you have seen, write the things which are, and write the things which are here, shall be hereafter. He lays for us a pattern right there in the first chapter, chapter 1. And then he gives us seven seals. Seal 1, seal 2, seal 3, seal 4, seal 5, seal 6, seal, six, seal 7. Then seven trumpets. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then seven bold judgments. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. What could be more chronological than that? Now, what I'm going to begin to do is I'm going to talk to you tonight about this transition that's going on because you'll recognize in the book of Revelation that Jesus had in his book, uh, in his hand a book, and it had on that book, it was written both within and without, and it was enclosed with seven seals. So if I've got a book here tonight, and this book is sealed up, I can, and, you know, and I've never got to read the inside of the book, okay? And I'm going to be, I, I can't start announcing the inside of this book to you until these seals are broken off, right? I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to get these seals off of here before we can even begin, right? Because that's what's going on here. And so you're gonna see a transition now uh, here take place at the opening, or rather at the fulfillment of the seventh seal. I want you to understand, don't miss this. The seven trumpets are, are contained within the seventh seal. So the seventh seal is not finished until the seven trumpets are finished. Are you with me? Now, this is where people mess up, mess up because then all of a sudden, it, the, the seventh seal is done, and now there's the announcement, now the mystery of God is revealed. Now the kingdoms of this world are come to become the kingdoms of our God. They're not recognizing what's simultaneously going on in heaven as well as the opening now of a book that was sealed up that no one could know. Now the mystery of the revelation. The seals are off. We can open the thing. 
okay? So it's an important transition time. Um, it's very, very important for me to help you understand a couple of things. And this is just by way of review. And, and that is, everybody that is on the earth during the seven-year tribulation, which I will describe later on why it's seven years, why we call it tribulation, etc. Everybody that is on the earth is under the judgments of God and are being afflicted by, the, by every plague that is poured out except for only one company of people, and they are 144,000 virtuous Jews who are men that have never known a woman. And they are described first in Revelation chapter 7 and then further described in Revelation chapter 14 who they are. And it is very pointed. They are 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. There's no mystical spiritualization here. It's very literal. These alone receive in their head a seal so that they cannot be hurt by any of the plagues. There's no guile in them. They are the sequestered group of people set aside by the Lord for a special work that is not fully revealed, but it's a special work during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And everybody else is getting whacked. I'm going to show you tonight, 58% of humanity will cease to exist upon the face of the earth before the seventh seal is done, before the first three and a half years. 58%, that's not counting the martyrs. The only way that we understand in the book of Revelation that you can come into the kingdom and be a part of the first resurrection is that you have to be martyred, and you have to be martyred in a specific way. You have to be beheaded. In the very beginning, at the opening of everything, John shows us three companies of people. He shows us the martyred saints who, are, who have to remain under the altar. They are not standing before the throne of God. This is a very important point that many Bible teachers and prophetic teachers miss. They are not standing before the throne of God. They must remain under this place of containment called the altar until all of their brethren who were killed as just as they were killed are fulfilled. And that's not going to be fulfilled till the very end. So this is at the beginning, under the first, under the fourth seal, fifth seal that they're revealed. Okay? Now it's going to be a now, and this is right in the first year. In the first year tonight, I'm going to account for a little over two years for you. Beginning at chapter eight, I'm going to count for two years, just a little over two years for you. And I'm going to show you how I've come up with that calculation. And um, it, of course, I believe, in, I believe in it being laid out before the body of Christ, but I'm going to tell you right now, you have to start studying, okay? You're going to have, it isn't going to be your favorite teacher and it ain't going to be, you know, something you heard somebody say one time. It's going to be a result of you digging in, you know, and, and do, playing by the rules, so to speak, and studying the Word of God. But I, I really want to impact you tonight that, my goodness, this has not started. I want to, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you the summary of the changes that will take place in the earth by the time we get to the fourth trumpet. So you know very clearly this hasn't started even though Kurds are being beheaded by, ISIS, by uh, the Islamic uh, group called ISIS. Okay? And it, you could even say it's a forerunner. I used to believe because of the 12th Imam, the description of the 12th Imam, that Islam was the whore of, of Revelation chapter 17 because there's been a dynamic of Islam that has existed since the ancient Egyptian empire. And the, she, the, the whore of Babylon sits upon a beast with seven heads which represents the ancient Egyptian empire, the Assyrian empire, Babylonian empire, Medio Persian empire, Roman empire, Grecian Empire, and then the seventh that will rise up during the days of the tribulation for the first part of the tribulation. And then there will be the eighth, which is the beast kingdom, okay, which is far superior to the beast kingdom, I mean to the seventh kingdom. But listen, I'm going to say this. I want, I want to get this, I want you to hear this, okay? Because when you hear the, tw the description of the twelfth Iman, he sounds just like the Antichrist. If you read anything about the twelfth Iman, okay, and what Islam or 
Muslims look for in terms of the return of Al Mahdi, right? Is it Al Mahdi? El Mahdi? Um, you, you, you get shocked. You go, wait a minute. This is a chapter right out of the book of Revelation that allows us to drill in a little bit more on the Antichrist. This is a chapter right out of the book of Daniel that allows us to drill in a little bit more on the Antichrist. And so for that reason, for the reason I see the fingerprint of Islam back from the ancient, its effect and impact in the Egyptian Empire, as, uh, the Assyrian Empire, etc., as I've said, I used to think that Islam was that. I've discovered that it's not true. I've discovered something far more sinister that I'm not telling anybody about. And if you've discovered it, you can come talk to me about it. I'm, la I'm interested in hearing what God has showed you. But the Lord has shown me a religious power that is far more sinister and that all we would be seeing in, in, among, you know, what's going on in Islam and the uh, Muslim movement, you could say it's a forerunner, okay? But I, what I want to really, really want to impre impress upon you tonight is that we're nowhere near the tribulation yet, okay? And I'm going to, and by way of review, I'm just going to go through some things for you that I've already talked about in, um, under the seventh seal, okay? And so, uh, under the first seven seals, or six seals, rather, number one, it, uh, it opens up uh, that during the tribulation, when the tribulation starts, there starts, there's global conquest. You know, we know that kingdoms shall rise against kingdom, nations shall rise among, um, uh, against nation, and there, there'd be wars, and there'd be rumors of wars, and we understand that it's like a, a woman who's about to have a baby. And so a woman is about to have a baby as the time of the deliverance of the baby comes and we're speking about the end of the world is the time of, and the return of Jesus. The time of the deliverance of that baby comes. Those contractions get closer and closer together. So the frequency of these wars, the frequency of this great chaos uh, increases. That's very important for you to understand. Ultimately to the point of global conquest. And as I've already laid out for you, and I showed you through the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, every man's sword will be turned against his brother. That civil war everywhere, everywhere. In the midst of this, every man's sword turned against his brother. And, and I'm not going to revisit all of those things. Good news is I've got them on YouTube. You can go and revisit them, okay? So we've got global conquest. Peace is taken from the earth. Can you even imagine that? Right now, we live in peace all over this earth. We've got a great amount of peace here in the UK. And we're talking about peace being taken from the earth on a literal global basis where there, once again, you can't find a place on the planet where a war isn't taking place. I want you to get that because then you now get to understand we're not in the tribulation yet, okay? And this is just getting started. Absolute economic control because it says the third horseman comes out under the third seal and he now describes how much a measure of wheat is. And he also has with him famine. So that is absolute economic, global economic control over the food uh, prices. That isn't, there, that isn't happening yet. 25% of the earth's population is killed. 25%. I'm going to add up 58% before we're done with the first three and a half years. 25% of the earth's population is killed by the sword, that's war, by hunger, that's famine, by plagues, and a unique thing that's going on, the beast of the field, is because what we hear here in this indication, there's an indication that the fear of man is taken away from the lion. You know, I've been out there in the bush in the Mpopo Valley in Africa, and the, and the hunter said, listen, if a, if a lion comes out at you, stand your ground, stand up big and tall and face him, because there's a fear there. He'll probably back down. If you in any way crouch or turn your back, because when you turn your back to run, you crouch, don't you? You bend. If you bend in any way, you're dead. The best thing you can do is stand up tall. That's a dominion posture, okay? Now the fear of man is taken away from the beast of the field. Now, of course, I don't want anybody to have to experience with that. And I know if someone's listening to me from South Africa, they're probably saying, I'm not going to do that. But everybody does understand, though, that it's in the know on this, the hunters, you know, what it is that I'm saying. The most important point that I want to make is, Beasts of the field don't have fear of men anymore. So we're, we're there, men are being killed by the beasts of the field uh, as much as they are really in, in this contrast with a, uh, with a sword and with hunger. And, and also think about when you, when you consider this level of famine of what's going on, uh, the beasts are hungry too, okay? So then also under the sixth seal, 
um, 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 forgive me, on the first six seals, we see great earthquakes, okay? Um, we see sun, the sun become as sackcloth, and the moon becomes as blood. Now, this isn't the kind of blood moon that they're describing, you know, that happens on a frequency in, in, in normal kind of uh, uh, context of physics as it is today. This is a unique event that takes place. This is, a sun, this is moon turned to blood. This is going to happen a total, I believe, of three times, clearly twice. It's one time the moon is, is just turned, um, is, just, is just black. There gives no light. But this particular instance, moon's turned to blood. This is happening before the notable, great notable day of the Lord, but it's happening during the tribulation, okay? And so you've got all these other things going around taking place at the same time. So if you try to isolate that and say that, well, this is going to be taking place, you know, in a unique time before the tribulation, you have no basis to do that. It's got to be in the context of the tribulation. People say, well, we can go to the sun and the moon and the stars and that they're going to tell us about, you know, the, the plan of God and be omens for us. Well, there's no basis really to believe that. You've got to take two verses of Scripture that exists, one in Genesis, one in Psalms, and then you've got to really kind of squeeze it to make that true, okay? Because there's a couple of different ways to understand that in the Hebrew language. But what we do know now that we live in the New Testament times, we've received the Holy Ghost who's going to show us things that are going to come to pass in the future. Not omens. Give me a break. You know, Jesus and both Jesus and Paul said, look, man, don't get caught up in, in, in looking at the stars like the heathen. Come on. And, 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 and signs in the sky. Give me a break. Stop that stuff, okay? Very important for me to make that point. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Stars will fall from heaven. We're talking about catastrophic meteor showers. We haven't had any of those. Anybody seen any of those? We never, we're, not even under, we're not done with the five seals yet, okay? We're still under the six, not done with the six seals, I should say, okay? Heaven departs like a scroll. <laughs> Anybody notice that? Heaven has not departed like a scroll. In other words, it literally, it's like when you, when you take, you've got a scroll and you've got it rolled up, right? Are you with me? And that's what you've got right now. The firmament that divides the water above from the water beneath, as is described in Genesis. Well, all of a sudden, you let go of that scroll and what happens? It snaps together. So it snaps together, closes up like a scroll. And what the result of that is, is men can now look from planet Earth up into the sky where the clouds float around right now and see the Lamb seated at the right hand of the Father. And they're going to cry out, both mighty men, the kings, the great men of the earth, all the way down to the nobodies, the poor men, and the slaves of the earth. Hide us from the face of him that sits upon the Lamb, on the throne, and from the Lamb. Okay? So that hasn't happened. Clearly that hasn't happened. Once again, this is chronological. Okay, this is going to happen in the first year. This is the first year of the tribulation. This is very important for me to emphasize to you. I want you to get that. I want you to feel it. I want you to go back and study it. I want you to be convinced of the chronology of the book of Revelation. Otherwise, men are going to deceive you. You don't even know where you're at, what's going on. And one of the big things is, is it steals from us our continual waiting upon the return of our master and watching and, and, and understanding where we're at in the, in the plan of God. Okay, now look at this. Every mountain and island is moved out of its place. Look, we know, we know that that nine, that point, nine point, what was it, nine point six? What was it? Earthquake in Japan. It was a tremendous earthquake that m moved Japan four degrees. Four degrees. There was a measurable moving of that island, and look what it created. Look what it caused. But we're talking about every mountain and every island moved out of its place. It shifts its, ge its geographical location, in other words. That is some serious wobbling. Then the, and, of course, you recognize that the prophet said that the earth will wobble to and fro like a drunken man. ...during these days. And you know, one of the things that I try to do... ...is while I'm giving these verses of Scripture... ...in the book of Revelation... ...is I try to take time to go back... ...to all of those Old Testament prophecies... ...that fit right within this period of time. 
so that people can understand what's going on here. We're talking about this is nothing's ever like this has ever happened ever since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the earth. You know, nothing like this has happened since I could at least say since the beginning of man, okay? Um, and, 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 and so you can't mistake it for, for Chernobyl. There are people that are preaching right now, and, and sorry, sir, and people that bought into this, but you're wrong. That the, the, the catastrophe at Chernobyl was the worm, was the star wormwood that fell out of the sky, and it's not even directed towards the sea. You messed up. It pollutes not the sea or the ocean, it pollutes the rivers and the underground aquifers. So that your springs and your wells are bitter. And it results in the death of a huge population of humanity. So it's just like, wait, stop. Why are you sending your money to that? Stop it right now. It's ridiculous. Why is it? I don't understand. Why people are allowed to make so much money and have such a great following. Teaching something that is so absurd. At least let it be close to being, you know... In the context of things. And so I'm, you, I'm passionate about this because I'm, it misleads folks. And, and, and that's just wrong. And I'm going to stand up against that. Okay? Every mountain, it says every. Every mountain, it says every in the Greek language too. And in the Hebrew language, every is always every. All is always all. Okay? Mountain and island moved out of its place. All men, both great and small, rulers and slaves, try to hide themselves from the wrath of the Lamb... No wind blows upon the earth or upon the sea or upon a single tree for a period of time. Some of these things happen, okay? Some of these things take place, like the moon turning to blood and the sun turning to sackcloth, but it isn't prolonged. We don't know how long it is, but it's not prolonged, okay? Because we're going to see other events happen to the moon and happen to the sun, so we know that it's not prolonged. We know that the wind is going to blow, so we know it's not prolonged, that it's going to be still. You, are you with me? Okay, these are events that take place, but just imagine how cold it's going to be for that duration that their sun is completely giving no radiation, no light. It's going to get cold. You're going to freeze in a second. You'll freeze. You're going to freeze. It's going to be, it's going to be, nothing like that's happened. That's my point. I want to make these points. I want to make the point that you don't want to be here. I want to make the point that all through the book of Revelation, you've got a, you've got a contrast. You've got celebration and joy and bliss happening in heaven while hell's taking place on earth. And somebody thinks that we need to be in the hell taking place on earth because somehow we've got to go through the hell taking place on earth to be worthy of the Lamb. Then grandpa's got to be raised from the dead to go through the tribulation. And great-great-great-great-grandma, who's a martyr here, has to go be raised from the dead and, be, and go through the tribulation. And Adam's got to be, I mean, Abel's got to be raised from the dead and go through the tribulation. That doesn't hold water. You can go through the tribulation. It's not, a, it's not the martyr's victory. It's blood victory for the ransom that are, re, that are redeemed and part of the first resurrection that are alive. As Paul said, we which are alive and remain. He thought he was going to be in the catching away. He didn't say, we which are alive and remain will go through the tribulation. He said, we which are alive and remain should be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Right? We which are alive and remain will not prevent them that are dead. For the dead in Christ shall rise first. Right? And we which are alive and remain should be caught up to meet him in the air. Ever to be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll prepare a place for you. Come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be with me. So we'll forever be with the Lord. Huh? And then when he comes with his armies of heaven, you and the armies of heaven, and not on the other side. Because the reality of it is, you either with the armies of heaven or you're on the other side. So, I mean, somebody's going to have to choose where they're at. Now what I want to do is I really want to, I want to kind of run quickly through um, Revelation chapter 8 through 9, which is the releasing of the seventh seal. The seventh seal is broken. This is the last thing that you need. That's the last thing holding the book, the book shut. You with me? That's the last item holding the book shut. Seventh seal is released. Now the book can be opened. Praise God. And who's on, there's only one who's worthy to open up the book. And who is he? Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's prevailed. John, 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 Revelation chapter 5, wept much because there was no one in heaven or in earth or under the earth found worthy. 
And he began to weep. And he said, don't weep, don't worry. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed. He can open up the book. Well, what is he going to open up the book and tell us? Oh, some bunch of bad stuff? No! No! He's going to tell us all the glorious mysteries of God that have been prophesied from the very beginning, from the first prophet, all the plan of the, of the ages where the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. That's what he's going to tell us. Remember, the seventh seal really is the means by which both the seven trumpets and the seven bold judgments are finally released. In heaven, as far as I'm concerned and what I believe and what I see in Scripture, it is now the marriage supper of the Lamb well underway. It's now time for rewards to begin to be given out. It's at that moment that we fully begin to realize who God made us in Christ Jesus because we step into a place where we see Him as He is, where we are like Him, and it goes on and on in that dimension that is fully revealed at that moment in time when we begin to rule and reign with Him in a whole nother realm, okay, having gone to the marriage. Praise God. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about that because if I start talking about that, I won't talk about anything else. Because I feel the anointing on it is something glorious. Only a certain amount of information is revealed on it. It's a part of what the seven trumpets, uh, the seven thunders uttered, I believe, which God said to John, don't write it down. And so we're not allowed to talk about it. And that's what the Lord spoke to me one day because I began to understand some of these things. And I'm going, Lord, this is amazing. He said, yeah, seven thunders, don't even talk about it. Don't even write it down. It belongs, it doesn't. Right now, we're just trying to convince people that I'm here and that I love them and I died for them and they can live the life uh, 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 of fullness of, 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 of my grace and my mercy and my glory. And, you know, so that's what we're going to do. But they're the things that are plainly revealed. We're going to go ahead and talk about them, okay? We want you to get excited about them. We want you to understand where you're at in the time clock and plan of God on the time scale of God's plan for your life, okay? So let me get right into this. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to say real quickly. I want, to, I want you to be listening for because we want to show you approximate two years of time. And then when this, there's going to be a transition here because when these trumpet judgments are done, the Lord is going to actually number the days for us of how many days are left in the tribulation. And he's going to number them of 1,260 days will be left. I mean, come on, what can be more accurately chronological that um now there's 1260 days left now he told us that because he's going to say now from this point on these things are going to happen and up to this point these other things have happened well 1260 days is three and a half years that's one half of the seven years right everybody could do basic math somebody said well i found an error in the in the calculation of days that's because there is a big difference between a solar calendar and a lunar calendar and right now we have a gregorian calendar right and there's a difference between the calendar that we live by and the calendar that the, the Jewish community lives by. And you can basically make up the number of days just from doing a study there. Okay? Are you with me? Everybody's, everybody here? Yep. I haven't lost you? Okay, good. Try it on. Check it out. It's a, the, the Hebrew calendar is, is a little bit difficult to come to understand, but there are, I see, I believe it is... Uh, Judaism 101, if you go to Judaism 101, just Google Judaism 101, they'll take you to a Jewish calendar and show you how to remember how to number the total number of days uh, per month um, by relating it to a keyboard, the, uh, a full scale on the keyboard, C to C. So it kind of helps you to remember it. And that's very cool. And, uh, you know, for those of you that are interested... You want to dig in this? If I'm interested. I'm interested in things of God. I'm more interested in, in knowing this, the things of the Word of God than on any other subject. You should be too. So, um, I want you to see now what is going to happen. The people have said it's already happened because they put us in the fourth, under the fourth trumpet. And if, it, if I haven't already convinced you that we're not in the tribulation, now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Okay? Because on top of everything else I've said, these things are going to happen. Hell and fire mingled with blood is going to fall upon the earth and one-third of the trees are going to be burned up. And listen to this. All green grass will be burnt up. 
Now, I want you to take pretty special notice of that. All green grass will be burnt up. Because we're going to have some green grass here later. Still under the, under the seven trumpets. Okay? And we know how that works, don't we? You go through a winter, huh? And you get back to spring. And guess what happens? Huh? Seed time and harvest. It won't fail. God's promise. Seed time and harvest won't fail. So the seasons aren't going to fail. God's going to keep the season. Seed times and harvest. We're going to have winter, you know, uh, spring, summer, and fall. So long as the earth remains, we're going to have that. So we're going to have all green grass burn up. We know we're going to have to wait at least six months. Are you with me? Before we're going to ever see any more green grass. You see this? Because I'm going to show you some green grass here in a minute. It's just very important for me to point these things out. Because I think if you're not careful and you're just reading real quick, you'll just pass over these things. Okay? And you re won't recognize that there's clues in here, subtle clues in here, help us to be able to have a timeline. Okay, the next, if, if, if there's going to be a fireball. This isn't coming out of heaven. God's going to just create a fireball. And this fireball is going to look like, it's so huge, it's going to look like a mountain on fire. And this fireball is then going to be cast into the sea. And one-third of the sea will become blood. This is unique. Anybody seen that happen? And then, come on, give me a break. We're not in the tribulation. Please. See, everybody, let this YouTube go viral. Please, Father, do it in Jesus' name. Do it so that there, there can be a contrast to the insanity. And, and I've got to be careful because, you know, I don't want to be too rude. Because then, and then I don't want to be too harsh and hard because then no one is going to, no one's going to listen. But, I mean, get, get passionate about this thing for a minute and then try to act normal. Okay. <laughs> so, when this happens, when this happens, one-third of creatures die in the sea. Somebody said, oh, it's just the Mediterranean Sea. No, no, no. You're going to have to go back through all biblical information then that clearly uses sea to describe all waters upon the earth and make it just the Mediterranean Sea, and then now we've only got one sea on the earth. And that's ridiculous. So the sea does encompass all oceans. And I could prove that, but I'm not going to prove that tonight. And we'll just have to see it, save a few things for later, okay? One-third of the creatures die in the sea. One-third of the ships are destroyed. Great stars fall from heaven. A great star fall, call, falls from heaven... It's called wormwood. This is all happening over the space of about two years. It's called wormwood. And a third of all rivers and springs and wells and underground water were, will be made bitter. Okay? The fa all, all springs, wells will be made bitter. Now, if you remember maybe the last time that we were here, I showed you from the prophets in Isaiah, Jeremiah, how that the rivers will be dried up. So they're not only going to get poisoned, you're going to have another percentage of rivers. The rivers that are running get bitter from this star that falls from the sky called Wormwood. Yeah, here's, here's something you're going to have to be aware of as well. In the scripture, stars many times refer to angels. We're going to see a star fall from heaven that has a key. Okay, so we get to know, we're going to know then that it isn't a meteor, right? It's referring to an angel. So it is a very big possibility that just as the star that falls from heaven that has the key to the bottomless pit, who some will identify as Apollyon or Abandon, Wormwood could be, a name of a, could be a name of an angel because they're given power to destroy things in the earth. They're given power to cause all kinds of calamity and plagues during this time. Why? Because God's pouring out His wrath upon sin and iniquity his wrath against sin and iniquity is no longer prevented and he's actually going to say it he says and they still will not repent for their fornication for their sexual immorality so people think that we are in this time of grace and god you know just winks at sexual immorality he doesn't he's just got deferred judgment on it there's one day he's going to pour out his wrath because he hates sexual immorality and because of their sorceries, and because of, of their thievery. And so I'll list those here in a minute, okay? This is what he's doing. And, um, you know, people are getting saved. Somebody said, but there's going to be saints during the tribulation. Yeah, 
How long does it take you a person to become a saint? Can anybody tell me how long it takes you to become a saint? Become a saint? As soon as you call upon the name of the Lord, you'd be saved. When you get saved, you're a saint. That's the way it works in the scripture. Huh? And there's people going to get saved. Somebody says, well, where are all these people going to get saved? Probably from the church. Probably from a great apostasy because there's going to be a great coming in and there's going to be a great falling away. Huh? There's going to be a great harvest and there's going to be a great falling away. And so people go ahead and now we're living in this time where you can drink alcohol and smoke dope and be right with God. You, can, you, can, you don't have to get married. You can have fornication. You've got all kinds of lasciviousness, pornography, everything. It's okay. Sin's okay. God's forgiven us. We're no longer under the law. Well, tell Noah that. The law wasn't. And all the people all out down in the days of Noah, they weren't under the law. And the judgment of, of heaven came upon them for their ungodliness and for their wickedness. You with me? People missing whole paragraphs here, whole chapters, making wild-eyed assumptions because they don't bring all the information together. And then the spirit of deception begins to work because the Lord is allowing it because we're in the last days and people are being deceived all over the place to believe a lie and to be damned. So somebody says, where are all these saints coming from? Why are these people getting saved? Because they just saw the catching away take place and all of a sudden all these plagues are coming upon them and they're crying out to God and saying, oh God, forgive me. Immediately, he forgives them because the Holy Ghost is still here. Somebody said the Holy Ghost is departed. The Holy Ghost is still here. He just said he's living and abide forever with us. And there's going to be many things that the Holy Ghost will actually be responsible for doing during the tribulation. We'll talk about those later. Okay? But nonetheless, just because they call upon the name of the Lord doesn't mean that that's it. No, they're going to have to get martyred because they're going to have to now make a stand. And they're going to get their head cut off and, head, and, and behead, beheading. Somebody said, oh, there's a bunch of... Uh, guillotines, or however you pronounce it, galatine, guillotine, whatever it is, okay, been shipped in the United States. I said, that's nonsense. I said, show me, show me. I want to see them with my eyes, then I'll believe it. And then there's these con concentration camps because they believe Obama's the Antichrist. That's why they're saying it. He just says, why do you say this? What's, what's the point? Because Obama's the Antichrist. Obama's not the Antichrist. He's from the wrong nation. He's from the wrong group of folks. He's not the Antichrist. But because they're trying to make their point, they're saying, oh, there's all these, you know, we're, we're going to get beheaded, people are going to get beheaded, going to put concentration camps. Nonsense. We're not in the tribulation. You'd have to believe that we're under the fourth trumpet judgment to believe that. And now, now I'm hoping that I've convinced everybody in here that we're not under the fourth trumpet judgment because we just got to the fourth trumpet judgment and things are bad. Okay? <laughs> they're really bad. Okay. Now, after this great star falls from heaven, and it makes one-third of the rivers bitter, one-third of all the fountains, springs, wells, aquifer, underground water, bitter. Here's what happened. Sun and an air, here's what, forgive me, here, here's what happened. Third part of the sun, third part of the moon, and third part of the st stars don't shine for a third part of the day and for a third part of the night. You're going to know when that happens. Everybody's going to know when that happens, okay? One-third of the day, it's daylight, but there's no sun. One-third of the night, the moon's out, but it's not, it, there's no light on it. And you look into heaven, and one-third of the stars that normally gave their brightness, gave a shine, or gave their light, don't shine. So that one-third of the day is, and one-third of the night cease to exist. Figure that out. Because I can't, okay? When you get it figured out, please let me know so that I can be a little bit, I can communicate that. That's a mystery. That's a radical mystery. That is, you talk about signs in the heavens. Okay, that ain't going to happen. It's not happened yet, okay? Now, a star or an angel, this is an angel, comes with the key to the bottomless pit, falls out, comes out of heaven, comes with the key to the bottomless pit. When he opens up the bottomless pit, something happens. The sun and the air are darkened from the smoke. Now, imagine what happens there. If you have, a, we, we, we have these various different models that if you had a huge meteor strike the earth, if you had a huge nuclear explosion, you would have a nuclear winter because, the, because of the, the smoke and the debris would create such a thick layer of blocking uh, radiation to the earth, we just freeze. We're, we just got cold again. Okay, 
I mean, you're looking at, at a number of the things, because I've given you, I believe it's four things that have affected the sun up to this point. Two things that have affected the moon up to this point. Two or three. Two things that have affected the moon up to this point. Three things that have affected what we call or refer to as the stars of heaven or meteors have happened, taken place. Now, if that weren't bad enough, okay, there are these, there are these special angel creatures, demon creatures, that come up out of the smoke. Because when the smoke came, some, y'all get people to see with smoke, but with something inside the smoke. They're called demon locusts. And they are for one purpose, to torment all men. And they will torment men for five months. For five months, they're going to torment men. Now, I want you to hold, hold with me because I'm going to show you something here in just a minute. Okay? So the demon locusts from the pit are led by the ruler, Apollyon, which many people believe is a synonym with the Greek god Apollo, the god of destruction, but certain Jewish literature refers to Abandon as an alternative name for Lucifer. I don't know that that's true. I just know that this guy's name is Apollyon. Abandon in the Hebrew, Apollyon in the Greek. And he leads this army. There's only one group of people that they do not hurt. And it, that is the 144,000 Jewish men. The only, everybody else is... If you're a Christian, a saint doing God's business in the kingdom here on the earth during the tribulation, you're getting whacked upside the head because judgment's falling on you. Now, what sense does that make? If I've been redeemed from the judgment by the blood of Jesus, what sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense at all. If he's, been, if he's my judgment, I'm no longer under judgment. I'm no longer under the death sentence or condemnation because that's what condemnation means. You're under the judgment or you're under the death sentence. And there's a wrath of God upon you. There's no wrath. Come on. Here... The wrath of God is on everyone with all of these plagues that I've named through the seven seals and now up to, to the fifth trumpet. And they've fallen upon everybody upon the earth except for a special group of virtuous men who've never known a woman who have no guile found in them who belong from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each. Somebody said, I don't have enough proof that the church doesn't go through the tribulation. I'll stack it up. To the, I'll stack it up. I'll give you more proof than you can think about for the next year just come let's talk okay they torment men for five months men will seek death now at this moment in time the power of death you can't kill yourself you can have your friend come chop your head off you don't have to carry your head around with you death will have departed men will seek death and not be able to find it for death will have departed from them Huh? You walk around holding your heart in your hand. I'm going to tell you right now, there's monsters here. I mean, this is going to be ugly. Ain't nobody want to be around in this. This is going to be whacked out. There's devils everywhere. There's demons everywhere. Everybody's running from their life. There's no time for anybody to do any evangelizing. And no church meeting going on that you can even... Everybody, everybody, all men are hiding in the rocks and in the dens and in the caves. That's what the scripture says. And besides that, my goodness, when this kind of stuff is coming down and there's meteor showers and every island and every mountain has been moved out of its place and there is such catastrophe and plagues, well, now it's time to have church. Now it's time to go out there in the highways and byways and compel them to come. Now's the time to reach the lost. This deferring it to another day, that's a deception. Now we're not done yet. Four angels right now are bound in the river Euphrates. I want to go off for a boat ride on the river Euphrates at some point in time and just make fun of those angels that are bound there. I'm looking forward to the day that I get to do that. I, I, like, I, was, I thought I was going to get to do it in 2001 because in 2001, we were going to have a crusade. I had dreams that Saddam, Saddam Hussein gave his life to Jesus. I had dreams of driving around with him in the Jeep and him showing me everything that he built and how he was consecrating it all to the Lord, how he was going to give this and that and the other to the Lord. Yeah. 
When I saw those trials, my heart was sick. Everybody else was rejoicing that somebody's going to be killed as bad men. I was a bad man. You were a bad man. Jesus redeemed us. Somebody forgot who got what, 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 what pit they got dug out of. And I said back then, I said, I said this is going to set, set, this is going to set missions back 100 years. We're going to have a crusade in Baghdad. This is going to set missions back 100 years. And I didn't realize it was going to set missions back all the way to the days of the Crusades. It was actually going to set missions back more than a thousand years. And then what bothers me is we have such a deceived group of people. We're all saying, this is what God is doing. Hallelujah. My goodness, please. Now I know I've just become extremely unpopular. Charisma is definitely not going to carry this. And if I could just learn to keep my mouth shut. But I can't. I've got to go ahead and tell it. Huh? God, God is in this, this kind of destruction when we were on our way, when we were on our way. I just so happened to be, you didn't have a crusade set up in Baghdad. I did. It touches me deeper. So, we come coming from two different perspectives. You're just thinking about whatever it was you're thinking about because your administration or CNN told you. I'm thinking about what we were getting ready to do in the kingdom and how it got prevented and now how we can't even go in there because Christians are being killed and sold out wholesale and hiding where before 2001 they were in the streets preaching and handing out Bibles. Give me a break. Are you with me? Yeah. And unholy about that. Demonic. Anything that's going to take the Bible away is demonic. Anything that's going to shut the preacher down is demonic. Come on, people. It's time for us to get, it's time to get in agreement with the Word of God. Well, I said too much about that. No, not really. I should say more. I mean, I, as far as ter in terms of coming down into popularity position, I said too much. In terms of saying what needs to be said, I haven't said enough. Four angels loose from Euphrates. They were loose for one year, for one month, for one day, and for one hour to slay a third part of men. Now the total is 58% of humanity has been destroyed by one of the plagues on the earth just in the first three and a half years. 58%. Remember, we had 25% before under the seven seals. For, on the first six seals, we had 25%. Now we got 33%, 25 plus 33, right? My math is good, 58% of humanity. And there, there's, that's unprecedented. For people to say we're in the tribulation and that we're here at this point, give me a break. It's just, it's just impossible. Okay, let's think about that. Let's think about it. Over half the population. There's 7 billion people on the planet. What are you going to do? with almost well, more than three and a half billion bodies. And we're not talking about the plagues that the angels are bringing, these fallen angels are bringing. We're talking about the plagues like it's happening right now with Ebola from dead body fluids. You know why Ebola ultimately came into existence? Because of demonic practices of worshiping demons in Africa. That's where it comes from because of the way they handled those body fluids and the way they handled their sacrifices and their ritual. True. True. Because I'm not going to talk about the hideous rituals that are so disgusting that they triple X-rated that they have going on right now. People need to be saved. Well, you have those kind of practices and you're going to get the vilest things as a result. I'm going to tell you something you can take and, and know as a wisdom principle. The wages of sin is death, or the wages of sin is destruction. Uh -huh. It's true. And then we're talking about a reaping a whirlwind of destruction. God help us. Okay? So, um, now, <clears throat> these four angels are going to lead a 20 million angel army. Demon locusts flying around stinging people, tormenting men for five months. These guys now come on the end of this thing, and for one year, and there's some overlap here, 
for one year, for one month, for one day, for one hour, lead an army of 20 million, 200,000, thousand. Mathematicians at 20 million, 200,000, thousand. 20 million. And with their whole purpose is to kill with fire, to kill with smoke and brimstone that comes out of their mouth. Now, one of the things that I failed to do, and I'm going to do it real quickly here, is I'm going to point out to you that this can't be released. Let me just show you this. Because I wanted to show you that grass is back again, okay? And uh, we knew that all the grass was burned up. There was a no, none in existence, right? So let's see if I can remember where some grass appears again. Verse 4 of chapter 9. That's where I thought it was too, so praise God. <laughs> I'm glad somebody's reading the Bible. And it was commanded then that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which did not have the seal of God in their forehead. So I'm looking at right there at least a period of six months. Just, just, think, about, just think about the time clock of getting into fall to spring, okay? So it's somewhere between six and nine months. Under the conditions, you know, uh, that we have been seeing under the sixth seal, it would be kind of hard to find any green grass after the famine anyways and then after the water has been polluted and after the water has been dried up but the green grass that is there because it's now all been burned up it's going to take anywhere from six to nine months before spring's going to come back around with me if we're let's just say we're at fall let's just take it six months does that make sense we're in fall fall to spring is at least six months right we've got then the events of the first of the first six seals We've got five months that the um, five we have five months that the demon locusts are going to torment men, and there can be overlap there to some degree. However, we are also got to keep in mind that it is sequential, and then we got one year, one month, one day, and one hour that these four you four angels that are bound in the Euphrates are loosed and lead an army of twenty million. So you can see how I'm calculating now. That under the just under the six or the seven trumpets, you've got almost two years. Because now what's going to happen is we're going to hit the transition at this point in time, and the transition is where we're going to begin to see things as as as, the, as what's happening in, in, in taking place in the heavenly realm, and 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 the catching away of the man child, which is 144,000, which I'll prove to you here in a little uh, prove to you at another time. Okay, we're going to see all this take place. And then we're going to actually have the number of days that are left. Before, and this is going to begin to demarcate the seven bowl judgments, which will be 1,260 days left. So we know that when we've calculated about two years here under the, under the trumpets and somewhere around about a year, we're still short about a half a year, we've dealt with the first three and a half years just under, just during the period of time that we've gone through the seven, seven seals and the six trumpets, seven trumpets, okay? And I don't know that I made that very clear, the way I just said that. Um, but hopefully become more clear as, as, I, as we move on. I want to point out one other thing before I let you go, okay? And, 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 I, and I, want to make, I want to make the point, I believe, at the end of chapter 9, what is it? I believe it's like verse 21. Let's look at it. Remember, remember, the seventh seal, you couldn't open the book because the book was bound with seven seals. And what's in the book is good news, not bad news. And John, because John wouldn't have been weeping and crying and saying, no one's worthy to open up the book and we want to see the bad news. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. <laughs> He's weeping and crying because it's going to reveal the good news. It's going to open up for us the mystery is going to release all of the blessing and unveil to us all those things which Father has stored up for us. And so we hear now, seventh seal, seventh seal really genuinely, I want you to get this, the seventh seal releases the seven trumpets. So really, the seven trumpets are part of the seventh seal. 
and the, seven tr and the seventh trumpet releases the seven bold judgments. So really the seven bold judgments are part of the seventh seal. When the seventh seal is broken, heaven's going to start rejoicing now. Heaven's going to start saying, listen to what heaven's going to say. Revelation chapter 9. I want you to look at this with me. Revelation chapter 9. And what is it? Um, I think it's Revelation chapter 9. I should be. Huh? Mm -hmm. No, I'll just hold up. I'm sorry, guys. I should have, I should have read over this. Um. What I, what, I want, what I want you to be able to see is the celebration that's going on in heaven, okay? Now, I'll go ahead and get verse 7 out of chapter 10, and I'll have to regroup later and give you the verse of Scripture that I wanted to point out to you. But there's a number of verses of Scripture right here at the end of of what is fulfilling this, you know, the fact that the seventh seal has been broken and it's been loose and now the book is about to be, as it were, unveiled of where there's this rejoicing in heaven saying the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our God. Huh? Chapter 11, verse 15. So let's look at, look, look at chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound... The mystery of God shall be finished. And actually, that's the first scripture I was looking for. So I was looking for it in the wrong chapter. Okay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and that's where we're at right now, we hear a sound from heaven. The mystery of God is finished, shall be finished, as he has declared the ser to his servants, the prophets. Once again, I'm saying that that clearly is the opening now of the book that has been sealed up that John wept much over because there was no one found in heaven, no one found in earth or under the earth that was worthy to open it up by loosening the seven seals. And the angels comes and comforts him and said, don't worry, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed. And so now it's that time. And now we're going to see a bunch of celebration going on in heaven. And, um, of course, there's an angel comes with a little book, which is a different book, gives to... Um, um, gives to Jeremiah, forgive me, gives to uh, John to eat, much as he gave to Ezekiel to eat. Wasn't it Ezekiel? Is it Ezekiel, okay, to eat? So that he might prophesy concerning the things that, is, that only the Lord knows. So he put his word on the inside of him in a special and very unique way. He came and ate this book. It was bitter. It was, was, this one was sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly. Huh? Just like it was with Ezekiel, Correct. Now, let's look real quickly at, at, at chapter 7, so I'll make sure I'm not missing anything. So he measures the court of the Gentiles. I'm going to talk about that later, and I want to go into that. I wanted to show you this verse of Scripture that now shows us that we are at the turning point of the three and a half years. Verse 3. Is it verse 3 or verse 4? Verse 3 shows that we're at the turning point. Now is declared the remaining days upon the face of the earth is 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. Are you with me? Here we are at a transition point. And for 1,260 year, 1,260 days, two prophets are going to prophesy, and they are going to release plagues, and they're going to release all kinds of destruction upon the earth as well. And they, we believe them, I believe them, and many of people that I stand in company with believe that they are Enoch and Elijah, and we have a number of reasons for why we believe that. fits right into the way that they prophesied in the time that they moved in. Enoch prophesied during the days of the, of the judgment of the, well, of the world uh, that was overflowed by water during the days of Noah, okay? Elijah also prophesied in a great time of upheaval, which he thought was actually the end of the world, and that's why he was so... He thought he was the one ushering in the kingdom of God, and that's why he was so disappointed when it didn't happen after that fire was called down out of heaven. I'll talk about that later. And God took him up, and re he was... He, his vision, his passion was end-day prophet, and, God, and Elijah's going to come back. Now, let me just say this. Everybody knows or believes that Elijah is one of these prophets. The only, the, 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 uh, 
the only disagreement that would exist is who's the other prophet. And some people say it's Moses. I say it's not Moses. And here's why I say it's not Moses. Because Moses lived, he died, he was buried. Okay? So Moses would have to then be resurrected from the dead. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to give you even another tough one to chew on. Moses, Moses, this is going to be tough for you. Get ready. Fasten your seatbelt. Don't hate me for saying this. Okay. Moses lived, he died, he was buried, and may have actually been raised to the, from the dead during the day that Jesus came up out of the grave. Because many of the former saints were seen, were walking in the city of Jerusalem after Jesus came up from the dead. Gee, it's, it's, it's perfectly reasonable because he's the first resurrection. Nobody could be raised from the dead until Jesus was raised from the dead. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, it wasn't when... People misread that because of the translation in Matthew. It wasn't that they weren't raised from the dead when he was crucified. People misread that. They misread it. They misread what's said. And I don't want to get into that and prove this to you tonight, but I'll prove it to you. Just email me. I'll show you the reasons. Okay, Jesus, the first resurrection, nobody's going to be raised up from the dead until Jesus raised up from the dead. Unto immortality. Okay? You with me? And do people be raised up from the dead unto mortality? So somebody said, well, it is possible for Moses, having though he, even though he was buried, okay, let's just say it happens all now. Even though Moses was buried approximately 3,400 years ago, it is still within the realm of possibility that he's going to be raised up from the dead, okay, just like a person that was dead and buried last year or, or three days ago, uh, which would be present set for that would be Lazarus, right? But it just doesn't hold water with me. It doesn't hold water with me. Now, what I'm saying is I'm saying the only other person beside Elijah that was a prophet who never saw death was Enoch. So he's perfect. He's been with the Lord in the presence of the Lord for more than 5,000 years, and it's appointed unto men, unto men to die. So does Enoch the only one that gets to be... Is Enoch, Enoch, I'm a little drunk in the Holy Ghost. Is Enoch the only one that gets to, to not see death when it's appointed unto every man? No, he was reserved as a prophet for the last day. And so that's why he's made even in the New Testament. The Lord will come with 10,000 of the angels to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. And that's really underscoring ungodliness isn't good. Are you with me? Is everybody with me? Okay. And, and um, there, there are more great things to say here. Let me just pick it up at... Um, let me pick it up at verse 15 and, and then we can... Um, I'll, I'll weave in the rest of the things in chapter 11 that I've left out, the next Revelation study, when I begin to emphasize the important events of chapter 12 and chapter 13, which really begins to set into position, I think, a greater clarity on what's happening right now. Because we're seeing the struggle for these events that are described in the book of Daniel and described in the book of Eli uh, Jeremiah and the book of Isaiah. Um, we're seeing in the book of the book of Ezekiel. I ought to take you to Ezekiel 38. But at any rate, we're seeing those things struggling to come into existence. But there is a number of major events that have to yet take place. And I, would use, I used to say, well, I would say, I would estimate that it's about 200 years away. Boy, the people say, why must you be unique on every point, right? But my, you know, why aren't you saying it's like with it next year? Okay, but really, reality of it is, is just looking at all the things that have got to happen, I would have estimated 200 years. But then, watching the radical changes that took place just over the past three years, I'm going, wow, this timeline can easily be accelerated. But I've got a lot of points that I can bring in um, to view that would show you that there is a serious amount of time still yet before the tribulation would begin. So... I'm going, to get, I'm going to give you some of those points and um, hope that you would remain vigilant, always waiting for your master to return because you, you don't know the hour. Back in 1970, people were saying, oh, it's coming, it's coming this year. It's this year, it's just a sign of time. Here's why it's going to come. I said, no, he's not going to come. And I said, what are you, what's wrong with you? No, there's too many events that haven't happened yet. All I'm going off is the word of God. I'm going off prophecy. I said, one of the big events 
It's, everybody's not saying he's delayed his coming. Speaking of his people, let us eat and drink. Now that's starting to happen. Now that's, uh, they start, things, things starting to get different now. Because now everybody's saying he's delayed his coming. He's not going to come. There's not going to be a catching away. We're going to go all the way through the trap, rapture. I mean the tribulation. They're saying rapture is not even in the, in the Bible, which is nonsense. Either they're ignorant or they're a liar. Because it is in the Bible. And the word is catching away in a synonym, which is just another, it was same way to, same word as rapture. Catching away is there. <laughs> we shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. That's rapture. Okay, and there's other places where it's used as well. But there are events that have to take place. There's things that have got to be set in order. That, that um, a number of the prophets clearly declared to us that just simply haven't, I mean, there's got to be some time for that to happen. And when I start talking to you about Babylon becoming the trade center for the world, and that kind of an economic shift doesn't take place in a day. There is major shifts and changes in, in society, sociology, economics, hope, I mean politics. Major shifts take place for ultimately Babylon to be what it's going to be as it's described in the scripture. Okay? And the rise of Edom, Mount Seir. Now, Seir's a huge heap of rubble. Bozrah, which goes from the bottom of the De Dead Sea to the Sea of Aqaba, which right now is desert, but it's become a Palestinian homeland. It's going to become a Palestinian homeland. Because they're the e ancient Edomians. They're not the ancient Philistines, just because they're in Gaza. They're not the Philistines, they're the Edomians. Philistines perished. Edomenians survived. And they survived right where, they, where the Lord planted them. They're the sons of Edom, the sons of Esau. When the, before Jesus comes to, the, to Megiddo, before he goes to the, the... Before Jesus goes to fight against the armies in the valley of Megiddo that we call Armageddon, he first stops off and makes war in Bozrah. Because the prophet said, who is this that comes with dyed garments dipped in blood from Bozrah? Bozrah is nothing. But it's going to be a great civilization again. Obadiah says so. Jeremiah says so. The prophet Obadiah, the smallest prophet in the Bible, people have neglected the prophecy, prophetic utterances that are, are, that are given there. How long does it take? What's going to happen? So, I mean, just think about the possibility that during the days of Abraham, that from the Dead Sea to the Sea of Aqaba, it was a fertile plain, just like the Midwest, grasslands. Because there's many reasons to believe it was grasslands, both biblically and secularly. What's going to happen? What happens in weather patterns and shifting of weather patterns? People say, no, you know, because of all the pollution and whatnot, you know, we're, you know, we're going to, Global warming. There's global warming. There's cycles of global warming. There's cycles of global, global freezing. And when those cycles take place and there's shifts going on in, 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 in the in environment, and there's some people espouse that there could be a polar flip, there's a lot of crazy things that could happen. What once was cold now becomes hot. What once was fruitful, you know, now becomes barren. What once was a wilderness now becomes a garden of Eden. Think about it. It's very, very, I mean, I could go on stacking up the, the, the things. What, we, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying things are drastically changing in the earth today. I'm not going to hold you over some, the end of some uh, prophetic assumption and tell you Jesus is going to come because the tribulation is about to start. Nor am I going to tell you you're in the tribulation because I've set forth the proofs that you're not in the tribulation and not even close to it in that sense of that magnitude of natural disaster that isn't natural. It is, it is actually purposefully initiated by God himself. He's pouring out his wrath. But there's a lot of things that are changing, events that are lining up right now. Need There's an urgency of 
we have an urgency here, folks. You and I, we have an urgency. I want to bring you into your urgency. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. That's urgent for you. You don't know if your loved ones are going to be alive tomorrow. That should be urgent for you. You get one small opportunity in this life to be able to live big for God. That should be urgent to you. There's a lost and dying world around us. That should be urgent to you. There is a latitude right now for us to be able to participate with the plan of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That should be urgent. If something else is urgent in your life, you've got to deal with the condition of your heart. I want to bring it down, not to some, you know, evaluation of, of, of current events to try to bring urgency into your life. I want to bring it down to your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to bring urgency into your life. The shortness of your life to bring urgency. You cannot say, listen to me, you cannot say that you are doing what God's called you to do when you minimize what you're supposed to be doing to doing nothing but showing up to church, giving in the offering, reading the Bible, and saying your prayers. Because the Lord describes something far bigger for us. He said, get hungry for the kingdom of God. We know what the kingdom of God is, righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. We know it's the manifestation of his power. He told us he wanted us to be baptized in the Holy Ghost so that we could have power to be his witness. And we know what that looks like. Those are the, those are the harvesters that he wants to raise up. He told us to be conformed to the image of the Son. We cannot act like that we're okay when we see that there's great need of increase of maturity in our life. The bottom line of it is, people, you don't have to be despairing either. Just be urgent about it. Just be hungry, because it's out of that hunger that we're going to be filled. It's out of that thirsty that the Lord thirst that the Lord is going to give us to drink from the from the rock from the water of life. Amen.